you could part of the technique and the value of this technique is that you can see through what's happened underneath. One thing I wanted to talk about just for a minute is uh, painting with intention. Um, I owned an advertising agency for years and couldn't paint at all. So when I finally got back to it, I was so excited that I would just paint anything. Um, I'd replicate photos, I'd go outside and paint, but I, I never had intention for what I was actually gonna create. And I started thinking back to how I did uh, projects in my advertising agency, and we would have a goal. We would have parameters we had to live within, and then we would have a goal that we were trying to achieve. So I thought, why, why won't that work for paintings as well? So what I started doing was a little program uh, Actually, this is the painting that, I mean, the uh, photograph that I was interested in painting. It's a, a, a little valley river in Florida. And what I do every time I, I decide I'm going to paint something is I go through this process. First thing I say is, what about this scene that I'm looking at or this photo that I'm going to deal with really flips my switch? What is it that makes me say, I have to paint that piece? And what I do is I write it down, usually not this big, just a little scribble on the side of my, my canvas or my um, paper. But what really gets me about this is the beautiful uh, natural curves of, of the river coming down and most especially the, the highlights of the grass um, in the sunlight. So I take that little note and I stick it on my Jill, you, you also are a plein air painter, so will you go out and do studies of uh, things like this? Yeah, actually, I'm mostly a plein air painter now, but in the wintertime in Michigan, not so much. Oh, come on, you need to <laughs> get it. I you need to be braver. I'm painting in plein air magazine th this month. Yeah, you're, uh, by the way, I should mention that you're on the faculty of the upcoming plein air convention. Yes, We're I hope excited. it comes on. I'm so excited. I was heartbroken both times. It was canceled last year, but... We're in a crazy time. Yeah. Well, it's not our fault. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but when I do plein air work, I especially do this because everything changes so quick that you can forget what you were excited about. So if I keep these little notes to myself, it brings me back and reminds me, no, I, I'm not chasing that light or, you know, the ripples that are happening over here. This is what I was interested in. Um, and the big thing for me is a focal point, whether I'm painting in the studio or um, painting outdoors or teaching in class, it's all about a focal point for me. Because if you don't tell your viewer where to look, they're going to look and you know where they want. And if there's something that is really making my heart sing, I want them to look at that. So I keep a little note of my focal point. So what I basically have is a little... Um, business plan, like you were talking about, Eric, you have to plan if you want to achieve something. Um, you have to have a roadmap. If you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. So that's, that's always part of my process. And what I'm going to show now is uh, uh, a watercolor painting that will vibrate underneath a pastel painting. Um, and basically what we're going to do is use the color wheel to try and approximate kind of the opposite color of the local color that is gonna be applied later. This is not uh, perfection, but it gives you a start on beginning to have some color and structure before you actually lay the pastel in. So I'm gonna start up with the sky and we've got a kind of aqua, light aqua sky going up looks a little pink. And, and the big thing about this is that you have to stay in the right value. So if this is a real light shade, then I want to go up here to a real light shade and drop that in. Now watercolor notoriously dries lighter than what you're actually ap applying. So that's gonna be pretty close to what I need. And also with watercolor, you start with the lights and move to the darks. 
So I'm going to try and find all my lights in this painting and approach them first before I start layering in the medium tones. So this greenish area up here is um, right about here. And if I come across, it's in the purple range. Now, since I know that something in the background that's green will turn bluish through the atmosphere and through atmospheric perspective, I'm actually gonna go with a bit of a bluer purple. Again, I'm just need a little bit more than that. I'm just looking for big shapes. No detail whatsoever. Now as I come forward, those lighter shapes are also going to be warmer. So when I have a golden shape like that, I'm going to come across. Looks like a bluish color. Bluish purple. I'm just going to go ahead and black those areas in. You guys have questions, you can post them in the comments section and I'll try to pass them along. Did you wet the paper before starting uh, the painting? I'm sorry? Did you wet the paper before starting the painting? No, I did not. This is UART paper, which I love. Um, and I just brush it on dry. And when I'm outside in the plein air situation, it dries really fast. So I just stick it in the sun. What and... paper are you using? Paper. What paper? Oh, it's called UART. And this is 400 grade. All right. And I'm actually um, using the paper, although sometimes and, and quite often, actually, I like to use um, the board. But this is such a soft kind of image that I like to take my paper and tape it over a bunch of newspaper. I call it packing my paper. So when I draw my pastel across it, I get a real soft um, feeling, not super um, hard. And sometimes on board, you get a real hard edge or a real dark edge. So in this watercolor um, way of doing things, I prefer to use the soft approach to it. You're getting a lot of questions about your color wheel. Is that a Munsell color wheel? And it, it's similar in the sense that you've got the, you've got the variations on the hue and the chroma. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not specifically a Munsell um, one, but what I liked about it was it shows from tints to values, you know, you have your two colors going around here, but what happens when you add white a little bit, a little bit more? What happens when you add black or dark color a little bit more? And not many of the color wheels do that. So um, that was attractive to me, especially for my workshops and the way I teach this approach. I'll put the name of it in Amazon. I just bought one. Oh. And <laughs> it's called a Spectrum Color Wheel. There you go. I couldn't remember. They will have a surprise day where eight or 900 of them will sell. Yeah, <laughs> I got to call them right, up right away and ask for a commission on that. Yeah, really, you should. And <laughs> um, um, they have them available, laminated, uh, larger, smaller, posters, framed, all kinds of options. in some of these we're we're boosting the economy with this program <laughs> glad to help <laughs> okay so um get into that river which is one of the favorite things um for me 
on this piece. I'm going to lay in, instead of blue, I'm going to lay in the opposite, which is orange. And So would you do this if you were oil painting too? Uh, would you lay in the, the uh, opposite color underneath? You know, I have not done that. Um, basically because with pastel, part of the beauty of it is being able to layer colors on top of each other without um, actually mixing them. In, yeah. in oil paints, you kind of mix your colors. Um, you don't have to depend on the color that's below it. Well, a lot of people will do it. We'll put a, a reddish tone under a primarily greenish painting, you know, for the grass and so on. But it's interesting to take this approach. I, I might try this. I actually do tend to um, use a toned underpainting for my oil paintings. Um, again, because a little of that sparkle shows through, but I've never actually done this on it. It might might be an interesting thing to try. Yeah. Well, maybe, now, maybe once you've tried it, you'll come back on and teach us how you did it. <laughs> yeah, I've made, done it a million times and it's not mistakes anymore. Okay. So, oh, I forgot. I'm kind of liking it. I'm liking it like this. Can you show us your palette real quickly? Can you kind of hold it up? No. You know what I'm using is relatively inexpensive praying watercolor paints, which you know I think you can buy now for ten bucks or something. Yeah. Um, I used to, these are actually ones I had from when I was little. Um, it doesn't have to be really good, great quality watercolor because most of it's going to be covered up in the process. Now, if you were doing an all watercolor painting, would you use the same watercolors? No, 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 no. I I have. Um, you have the real deal. Of, um, you know, professional. Yeah. But for this, place. for this purpose makes sense. Saves yeah. money. You've got a pretty big audience today. Great. You're obviously very popular. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, you will be after today if you're not. <laughs> You're a good teacher. I'm going to put my dark, my darkest things in right now. My darkest shapes. And again, you can see there's no detail in this. It's basically shapes. And I'm going to just step here. in for those who just tuned in. I just got this question from India. And that is what she's doing is she's creating an underpainting in watercolor for a pastel and she's using the color wheel because she wants to put the opposite color underneath what she's ultimately going to be using. So you're going to see her lay the opposite color on top. How'd I do? You, you're a good student. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I were a good painter, I'd, I, I could be teaching this myself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so at, this is the point I'd stop. And actually, this is the point very often where I'll be out plein air painting and somebody will look at the scene, look at my painting, and then go, oh, honey, how long have you been painting? <laughs> <laughs> because they think this is totally crazy, which it is. Um, if you're out plein air painting, all you have to do is put this on the ground, let the sun hit it for a couple minutes and it dries. But in the studio, I usually hit it with a hair dryer, which I'm not going to submit you to. Um, I actually did another version, so I would be ready to go. Oh, like a cooking <laughs> show. I love it when people are prepared. <laughs> I'm, a, um, I'm a little obsessive in that way. That's why I like this idea of um, having this plan. Um, you can see the way um, I changed the painting. Oh, I never did put up. A little note, Anne, um, you did? Yeah. So planning ahead has helped me. I throw away so many watercolors. I throw away so many oil paintings by not making decisions ahead of time. 
and I finally learned. I didn't want to take the time to do this when I was out plein air painting. It was just like a bother. And it changed everything when I started doing it. So, so uh, uh, Peter in England is asking, how do you prevent watercolor from running when I paint my board? Uh, it's a much shallower angle to prevent this. Uh, I don't really care about the um, watercolor dripping. Sometimes I'll dab it off but it just adds to the energy of the underpainting because you're going to, you're going to put pastel over it anyway. And I don't want it to be so perfect. Um, I, I'm open to it being a little more haphazard and, you know, a little more interesting. Okay. I like getting close up on the painting like that. Thank you. So you're laying in some sky. Very lightly, super light. You can always come back darker, but part of the technique and the value of this technique is that you can see through what's happened underneath. Nice. So I'm, I'm layering on a little bit darker blue at the top and I'll feather that together. But still just be cognizant all the time that I don't want to fill the whole thing. And, and I can always come back. Right now, I want to just black in my you're, colors. Yeah, you still and, got about 15 minutes, so you're doing well. Cool. Um, you can get two or three done in that amount of time. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> just whip them out. Um, so somebody is asking, what is the science behind putting the opposite color in the underpainting? Well, um, as long as you're in the same value... You can put any two colors together, but especially um, colors that are complementary to each other, and they make a kind of vibration. Um, can you get real close to that? And maybe um, you could just explain for some people who might not know that, what does it mean, what does it mean complementary color? Oh, a complementary color um, is basically the opposite on the color wheel. So if if red is the color. Um, Can we see the color wheel with, now? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> if red is the color that you're working with, if you want to do the complement, it would be in the greens. If yellow is what you're working with and you want the complement, it's a purple. You know, and, and there's variations of that because purple isn't just one color. Sometimes it's red violet. So that's why this wheel is really helpful. Um, but even, even if I put two different colors in this blue that were similar colors of blue, they would vibrate a little bit too. Oops. The concept is called color harmony. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you to my workshops. Yeah. You haven't been able to do any workshops this year, have you? No, all my workshops were canceled. Almost every single plein air festival I had on board was canceled. Um, we did do a couple small ones at Paint Grand Traverse and a couple other places. Indiana had a couple that we did. But um, for the most part, it was, I still paint, plein air painted a lot. I just didn't do it in a business like way. I, did, I explored on my own. Yeah. So I'm working down, um, oops, that's too dark. I'm working my way down um, this painting just to get some local color in place. And then I can t take a step back and look at it. Someone in the comments said, complementary colors placed next to each other will intensify each color, both colors. That's right. And it also keeps you getting from getting too precious because if you're trying, if part of your business plan is to have these colors vibrate, um, then you can't you can't overpaint them. Uh, I use all different kinds of pastels, um, and I basically paint with them. 
but you have to have the right edge going on them. Okay, I'd like to people chime in where you're where you're watching from. I see India, a couple of people from India. See England, Minnesota, Blaine, Minnesota, <laughs> Peoria. What brand of pastels do you use? Oh my. Um... If you talk to any pastelist, they'll tell you it's a sickness. You have to have so many different types of pastels because some of them are harder, some of them are softer, some of them have um, different shapes, and you know there's just so many colors, and you just have to keep buying them all. Just buy them all. So my favorites are Sennelier, um, Terry Ludwig, uh, American Great American. Um, Oh, I, I first bought a um, uh, set of Rembrandts when I first started, which is a medium set. Um, and that was a good starter set if somebody's learning. And, and it's used usually in early in the, the process because with pastels, you, you usually work lighter to darker. Uh-huh. Yeah, buying stuff is a sickness, but it's sure a lot of fun. <laughs> <clears throat> we have Italy, Canada, Quebec, San Diego, Netherlands, Spokane, San Diego, Oregon, Ohio, Kansas, New England. Oh, my. Um, my oh, guy. someone has a support group for art supply addiction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need that. Tell no, you don't. We need, we need to support the art suppliers. <laughs> If, if they don't stay in business, we don't stay in business. I agree. And they are so generous. I, I was really lucky this year to win quite a few awards in a in pastel contest because I wasn't able to be much in my galleries or other places. So I applied to a lot of um, exhibitions and was super lucky to win a whole bunch more pastels. So I swear to God, I have at least 10,000 pastels. Yeah. Well, you just have to paint more. Yeah, I, and not in my lifetime. <laughs> it won't, it's like not possible. I'm going to go in and re reestablish my darks. all of these i'm not fully covering the paper this was actually a, a way of working that let me loosen up a little like i can tend to get too tight someone's asking if you use an air purifier i do i don't have it on right now because um I thought the noise. Here, here. i've got a hepa filter behind my my easel One of the things I do too while I'm painting is I keep um, separate boxes with my warm and cool colors in so that I can quickly see in comparison which colors fall on the cooler side and which fall on the So you're the pulling out side. you're pulling out the colors in advance that you're you're likely to use. Yeah, actually I did because um, I didn't want to be searching around on camera for you guys, but also I did a, um, <laughs> I did a practice painting <laughs> because, you know. Because <laughs> um, you're a I professional. Just, <laughs> um, and I just left them out. Every once in a while I dump everything that's in my hand out and put them in the right box. So you've got about 10 minutes, just so you know. Oh, well, I definitely won't get done, but you can, uh, hitting my, my focal point. Maybe you can show us the practice painting when you're done. 
Okay. Each one comes out completely different. Of course. And when I'm doing this, I'm always thinking, how can I use the lines of the land to um, move toward my focal point so that somebody will see that that's, that's the place that I want them to look at. Okay. Were you a Girl Scout? Because somebody said that you must have been. You're so prepared. <laughs> yes, I was a Girl Scout. And, and I was in junior achievement. <laughs> but, you know, I think what it's really based on is the fact that I ran my own advertising agency for so long. And you don't stay in business very long if you're not prepared. Oh, boy, that's so true. I was in junior achievement, too. <laughs> we were both the nerdy ones <laughs> in school. But yeah, it, well, it you know, the nerds training. rule the world today. So there you go. just saying. I'm a proud, proud nerd. <laughs> Another thing I do, which is um, kind of obsessive, if we're going to talk about obsessiveness, I save the pastel dust and the little crumbles that uh, come off my pastels. And I... Uh, save them by color. So I make these really cool pastels. This is a bunch of dust from greens, but it's a whole bunch of greens in there. How do you collect? And, you collect it out of your air filter or how do you do it? Um, no. Um, when, I, when I break pastels in half, um, they often, you know, shatter because yeah. it's just part of what, the, what we deal with. Um, and I, uh, I just collect all that till I have a good bunch. And then I put just a smudge of water in it because pastel has the least amount of binder of any medium. So it yeah. is almost pure pigment. And that's what part of the glory of it is. It's, it's like painting, you know, with pure color. So you can save those pieces and crunch them up with a um, pestle and mortar and over, if you smush them down enough, you can't leave big chunks in there. If you put just a little tiny bit of um, water with that, you can create a new pastel. Like, you know, I don't have enough already. But, yeah. Do you have, uh, do you have pastel molds? No, no. You just uh, roll them in a little ball. Really? You just pick up, and I'm, I'm talking you very, very little a very bit cool. of water. And you roll them. Um, into a little, I was going to say doobie, not that. Um. You are from Michigan. <laughs> Let's see, that was, that was legalized in Ann Arbor way before anybody oh, else. Yeah. Um, okay, we got the drift. Uh, so you have been dubbed by Rana Katz in the comments as the Martha Stewart of pastels. Oh, God. Is that a compliment or a... <laughs> That's a compliment, mostly. So... <laughs> Stay out of prison. I don't do any of that inside trading stuff. Okay, so now I have. Well, no, I don't have this time. I have most of my first layer down. I'm going to see this is kind of bluish. Somebody in the comments said we need t shirts, so we need to know what they need to say. Somebody said the other day they needed Eric Bobblehead. That would be pretty scary. <laughs> oh, I think that's a great idea. Uh, that would be pretty scary. <laughs> My wife would give me a hard time. She'd say, okay, your ego's a little bit out of control. You got 30 <laughs> portraits of yourself hanging around the house. Now this? <laughs> that is pretty cool that you've had all these great artists do portraits of you. Well, you know, More now two or three of them are gone, so I'm really thankful. I. Uh, the only one, uh, there was one that was scheduled that never got done, and that was Raymond Kinsler. And I went in twice to his studio in New York, and he talked the whole time, and, and which is was fabulous because his stories are so wonderful. Uh, but, you know, he took some photos and then was going to do a study, but we never got it done. So that's, uh, that's one regret I have is not getting that one done. And I have them all except for one. I, um, so I'm pretty lucky. That's got to be a world record or something. 
for how I don't many? know. There's some. There's somebody said that um, that the, uh, well, the what's the museum in New York in uh, Smithsonian the portrait or the, yeah, the portrait gallery portrait gallery. Somebody said I should contact them. I, I don't know. It'd be a great show. Well, it, it'd be a, it'd be kind of weird. Same on su- you know, one subject. <laughs> That's really looking good. I'm, I'm usually stepping back all the time. I feel a little bit hindered that I can't um, can't do that right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's looking pretty colorful to me. So we're at about the four-minute mark, just so you know. So we want to make sure that there's a chance for you to maybe show us uh, the finished one that you did and maybe come back on camera. So you can stop when you decide. This might be a good point, or you might want to keep going. Even though I know some of this is green and or um, warm green, since it's going back in the distance, I also know that it's it's going to turn bluer. So I'm trying to tone down some of this back here so it fades into the distance. Is this paint or tooth? This paint, this paper is toothy. Is it? It's not sanded paper, is it? It is sanded paper. Oh, it is? Yes. Okay. I, I'd say as sanded paper goes, it's probably like middle of the road. Um, UART is great because it comes in all different um, levels of sanded. I think from 600 to maybe 200. This is 400. So this obviously has a lot more to, oh, that's too dark. If, whenever I'm painting, I'm constantly going darker or lighter, lighter, smaller or bigger, warmer or cooler. It's a constant kind of um, comparison that goes on every minute. So that's kind of wild and scary. It's still got quite a ways to go. Somebody just suggested we need a hat that says, Art got me through 2020. (laughs) I'll make it if you'll buy it. (laughs) By the time I get them done, 2020 will be over. Okay, Jill, we're going to have to tell you to put the pastel down. (laughs) You did great. There's one that I finished more. I don't don't know if it's done or not, but let's get a close up of that. Oh, yeah. So you can see, yeah, so scan back and forth between the two so we can get a feel for where this one is, right? So still big shapes. Now let's move over to the next one. Yeah. So much more refined. Well, that's just beautiful. And those, those underpaintings showing through very subtle, but they do make a difference. Yeah. If you get, it's hard to get real close, but the the red shining through here and the oranges coming through this one, I think I went too far. I'd like to be somewhere between these two. Okay. Terrific. Like I, I need to be snapping my hand with a ruler all the time. Okay, show us, uh, show us a little bit more of your studio real quickly, uh, just because some people may have just tuned in late. If uh, I, Are we handheld with the camera? Looks like it. Yeah, my wonderful assistant, Tia, is... Um, All right, very nice. This, very this nice. is my computer area where I do all the business. I, I um, work on the concept of multiple streams of income, so I sell a lot of prints to... Um, art consultants and hospitals, restaurants, things like that, of paintings that I've already sold. Um, So I do a lot with that. And then this is kind of the area where when I bring people into my studio, um, I show them work. I'm going to have to. Lots of storage. I'm going to have to interview you for my art marketing course because you you being a former marketer would be brilliant. 
Uh, I'm I'm a big component. Uh, I mean, a, a proponent of um, advertising marketing. I I try to do for myself exactly what I told my clients to do in advertising, which is get yourself out there. So let me ask you a couple of questions about that real quickly, because I think this is a a great topic. A lot of artists feel like they're selling out if they're advertising. Um, How do you overcome that, that feeling? I do notice that. And I think they feel not only that they're selling out, but they're bragging because they don't come from a marketing background, but the, the point is, oh, do you think somebody's going to find you alone in your studio? It's not like the old days where the galleries um, paid for artists to paint and then promoted them. Right now, galleries are retail. And if they don't sell your painting off the wall, they're not going to support you. So um, I advertise in Planner Magazine and Fine Art Connoisseur and, and some other locations. Um, and I there are you should you might as well tell you now there are no other locations. <laughs> well, I was nice <laughs> enough to avoid saying them, <laughs> but I do face Facebook a lot and Instagram, and I did Twitter for a while, and I do newsletters and art alerts, and I, I'd say my marketing is at least forty percent of the fifty to sixty hours a week that I spend on art. Yeah, that's um, pretty I'm impressive. Dealing with my galleries and entering shows that's all marketing too yeah so there is a um there's a couple of concepts that i'd like you to address real quickly one is not having everything resting on a single pillar uh right the idea that if you're just doing one thing if that one thing fails you fail what are your thoughts on that are you talking about in marketing yes yeah okay because i do that as well in my work um right but um yeah, I think you have to really do some research on who your market is. Um, I, I was always in Plein Air Magazine, but then I decided that my market might be a little more um, the collectors from the fine art connoisseur area. So I split my advertising between the two. Um, and, you know, I realize who, where the, my galleries are, are important. It's the ones that sell the best tend to be in resort areas where people have a lot of discretionary income. Um, you have to think it through. You can't just want something because it's cool or because that's what you want. Um, you need to think about who's your prospective client and go where they are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jill, this has been fascinating. Thank you for doing this for us today. I want everybody to visit jillwagnerart.com. Uh, 